What can you grow in a water environment around you? Are there ponds? Are there lakes that you could stock out with fish, turtles, something like this? Could you create an environment for birds there? What can you put in play with a water environment? And could you actually turn it into an aquaculture facility where you're actually farming the fish? Adapt 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift affecting global crop output, but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time, cold weather crop losses. Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. Welcome back and thanks for the kind applause. My name is David Dubine, your host for Mini Ice Age Conversations, Studio A, Revolution Radio, Thursday nights from 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time, listener-supported radio. You know, I had talked with Ben Shields from the right media just in the last hour, and he was alluding to... Venezuela and the Chinese bringing their government and military, citizens, etc. to move into the country. Now you have to wonder what this is going to be with the political play and how much influence China, Venezuela and that military is going to have in the Panama Canal for shipping, including grain shipments to and from the U.S. or if they are going to try to take over part of Venezuela and use it as a bread basket grow zone as parts of northern China go offline. As you've seen through every grand solar minimum, the north part of China comes into extreme cold and drought. And they, this is the reason that emperors changed about every 400 years. 1600s, when you go to the Ming Dynasty, same thing. It was a mega drought in the northeast. Come back into the famous Tang Dynasty. They were literally at the apex of their art, science, literature of anywhere on the planet at that time. Just like we are today. We think we're at the apex They thought the exact same thing, and they were completely wiped out due to, yep, drought and cold, not being able to grow enough crops. So the Tang Dynasty also ended during a grand solar minimum. The Yuan Dynasty at 1200 AD also. So you start to see that regardless of the amount of power or the, I don't know, the pyramid of power that's in place for government over citizens, whatever, it collapses. So if China were smart, they would be looking for other food growing areas on the planet. And, you know, they've already scouted out, put the rail lines, made the deals and contracts with northern African nations. And if you haven't noticed, this is what I want to bring into is the wind patterns on our Earth are changing at the moment drastically to the point where when you see these stories, you're like, all right, that is definitely a jet stream shift. So the magnetosphere is weakening due to the de- decreasing sun, the magnetic fields on the sun, the coupling with our Earth. Our magnetic shield gets a little bit weaker in the magnetosphere. So the jet streams can go wandering. So here's a couple examples here. I'm going to bring you over to the Watchers. This is one of my favorite sites. They have a really good rundown. And if you guys are listening out there, I appreciate the, uh, the effort you put into upkeep your site every day or every couple days. The Watchers.news. Consider a consolidator site where they take all these stories around the planet that are within this realm and they put them in one place to find them. In the Mediterranean, Medicaine, that is a Mediterranean hurricane, Medicaine, hence the name Zorbas, is forming and threatening Greece, already has passed over. Now, this still has a chance to become the strongest Medicaine ever recorded on our Earth. Well, at least since we have modern instrumentation to to measure pressure drops in the atmosphere, let's say that. There might have been more powerful Medicaine. I mean, we saw a lot of Fleets go down in the Mediterranean over the last, what, four or 5,000 years? And this episode is brought to you by TrueLeafMarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds since 1974. Full range of garden seeds, 
microgreen seeds, sprouting seeds, wheat grass, grain seeds, flower seeds, herb seeds, and ground cover crop. I encourage you to take a look at the website, trueleafmarket.com, and they even have free starter guides there for you to learn how to grow sprouts, microgreens, herbs, and wheat grass. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. Go back to the Phoenicians. Hell, they got stuck up there as well off of Egypt. Got taken down. It wasn't on the Red Sea side. They were actually inside the Mediterranean. They'd sailed all the way around Africa, up through the Azores and come all the way up. How do you find that these winds are getting so much stronger? It has to be an atmospheric anomaly. And then also what we find is a repeating cycle if we go down to the southwest Pacific. So if you have the equator and you go south of the equator toward Australia, this is where that cyclone is located. It's right over the Solomon Islands, just a little bit east of Papua New Guinea. Now, generally, you got that equator running through right there. It goes through Papua New Guinea, and then it goes right through Indonesia. Singapore is just a little bit above the equator there, that whole place. The cyclone is in a rare spot. They say it hasn't formed a tropical cyclone in the southwest Pacific since 1950. Now, you have to think, we're going back in cycles again here. The northern Pacific this year was in a 50-year cycle, the same thing that occurred in, say, 1967. They're repeating the same types of weather. The hur- or the typhoon tracks are the same. Japan with the all-time record earliest snow ever recorded in the last 300 years occurred this year. There was August 18th. They received several inches of snow in Hokkaido Island. So we're starting to see these patterns of wind anomalies and storms coming back on these multi-decade or half-century cycles. And then you really start to understand that it is absolutely a cycle. It is not with us to do with CO2, putting too much CO2 in the atmosphere. Although I will agree, and I'll say the particulates that are going up there from ship tracks, airline exhaust, all the factories across the planet, exhaust fumes from our vehicles, This particulate is making a change, for sure, unequivocally. And how about all the plastics in the ocean, etc.? There's a lot of stuff that is doing far more damage than CO2, let's put it that way. Japan mainland. All right, now they've already been water-soaked and rain-flooded and landslided and just decimated this year with rainfall. They're going to come in something like triple, triple or more, the usual average rainfall. Now, if you couple that along with over in India, they're having at least four and a half times more rain than the average. So what is going on? And can you trace these massive rainfall totals back in cycles? Can we go back 100 years and then find also when India had three times more rain than average? Is grand solar minimums intensifying the already intensification of the cycles? So you have to think about we have these smaller cycles Nine-year cycles of water from the North Atlantic being pushed under the Arctic ice cap. That's in a nine-year cycle. How about the solar cycle? 11-year regular solar cycle from solar maximum to solar minimum, 11 years. Then we start getting into, how about the Pacific Ocean through the El Nino, La Nina cycles? These are really short. Southern Oscillation Index, that's for the Southern Oceans. How about the Indian Dipole? I mean, that's months when it flips over in the Indian Ocean from cool to warm, warm to cool. Some of these cycles are larger in time. When we come back, how about the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation? This is called the AMO. This is a 60-year cycle of the Atlantic water temperatures cooling and warming every 60 years. Now, the last time it was warm was the 1930s. And then as it descended down and troughed out and it got cool again, it didn't get down into the trough of the cool until the 1970s. Then it warmed up in the 90s again, the hysteria of global warming. Well, look in the 1930s, Dust Bowl era, incredibly warm. And then 60 years later, global warming again, the 1990s. But, oh, we are slipping off. And the Atlantic water temperatures are starting to cool significantly which has a, it's going to be a, like a pincer approach here. There's two things that will happen because of these cooler waters. And remember, this is just a cycle. These have been mapped out. People who trade futures in the commodity market 
follow these same rainfall pattern cycles based on the very same ocean temperatures, warming, cooling, El Nino, La Nina. Grain traders follow this stuff because it is a cycle. They know when Pacific goes cold, it'll affect the moisture here, it'll flood there, it'll be a bumper crop here or whatever. They got it mapped out really well across the planet. So the Atlantic Ocean is going cool in its 60-year cycle. Okay. Europe is going to get much more snow and be much cooler during this time, period. UK, Europe, more snow, colder. Shorter growing seasons, wetter, and that's all that's going to happen right now. Secondly, the, the cooler water that's being pushed under the Arctic ice cap in its nine-year cycle, that's David Dilley's research, there's going to be more, more Arctic sea ice. The thickness is going to be thicker, and there's going to be a more broad coverage over these next couple of years. And I'm really wondering how the powers that be in the IPCC, et cetera, will try to explain this away. But anyway, that's a 60-year cycle. So we have two-year cycles, five-year cycles, nine-year cycles, 60-year cycles. And then we come up to centennial minimums, what, a 100-year cycle. We've got Veres cycles, grand solar minimum cycles. These are 400 multi-century cycles. And then they're all encapsulated as well within even larger cycles of 2,000 years, 3,600 years, 7,200 years. But you've been told it's CO2. We're just repeating a cycle. And, you know, you can't tax a cycle. I think that's the whole part here. You can't tax a cycle. People won't be afraid of a cycle. Well, yes, they will. If you tell them that they have the power to control what's going to happen in the future, it's much different than going, all right, we're going to repeat a cycle and you better hold on for the ride and get prepared because the last umpteen of these cycles squeeze the human population down 25% or more. And again, just even reading the news headlines off the watchers here, cycles, worst floods in Himachal Pradesh in India since 1995. Okay, let's go back to then and what was happening in 1995. And then could you find other storms that were happening and then match those to others? Oh, yeah, Japan. Epic snowfalls, 1970s as well. So most people are predicting a 1970s type of repeat winter coming up this year and intensifying next year. So this year is slated to be the coolest since the 1970s winters. Now, any of, you, any of those that were alive during that time, you, that kind of winter, just expect that. Wherever you are, Northern Hemisphere, up around Canada, New York, anywhere you are. Could be over in, in Russia, could be Northern China, wherever you are, 1970s winters is what you will expect. Now, you're looking here at the Tunisia. They got 5.6 feet of rain in one day, six months worth of rain in a single day. Now, Tunisia is right in the middle of the Mediterranean rim countries, if you will. And I bet if we went far enough back, we could definitely find at another time in the past, maybe not 20 years, maybe not 100 years, but maybe multi-thousands of years in some writing or entries, ship captains, traders along the way, anywhere at that time, maybe 2,000 years ago, they recorded somewhere a... a Five, six feet of rain in a day. Now, if you can start to map up these multi-century cycles together, you get a really good indication of what we're going to repeat. Now, my personal opinion is it's going to be something much more heavy and much more powerful than a 400-year cycle. I'm absolutely convinced at this point. I will, you know, you can agree or disagree with that. It's just what I've seen and, and read and Talked to a few people over the, the last couple of weeks while I've been back in the States here. Yeah, we're going into something much more powerful and much more intense than just a 400-year cycle. So if you see governments spending strangely, acting reckless, if you will, with so many things in our society that we're seeing today, you know, wherever you look, it's political hacks going on, control of military, saber-rattling, whatever it is, reckless spending, I mean, endless debt. I think they just know they're not going to be paying it back with today's value of dollars or yen or whatever it might be. I think the powers that be understand that we are in a squeeze point 
and a reset button here, a society reset button. And no, that, that's like a mild way to put it. If you knew, you'd never have to pay it off because the value of real estate would decline to the point where people would abandon cities. Population of the earth would decline by 35% or more. And most fiat currencies on the planet would no longer hold their value. There might still be a couple strong ones out there, but the major shifts would go back to the commodities, gold, silver, etc., like hard commodities that people can hold on to that have value, like food, crops, grain, etc. So imagine if you knew that none of it would ever have to be paid back. You would do the exact same thing they're doing right now, a government-wise across the planet. And now it makes sense. If you look at it from a logical standpoint, it doesn't make sense. Why they would have such a reckless spending, why they're doing all these wars, why they're trying to prepare this, why they're setting up the police state, why they're doing this, that, and the other. Makes no sense to a logical, thinking human being. But they want you to look that direction. That's the whole thing. They want you to look straight at the smoke and mirror show that they're putting on. It's like a magician. They're saying, look in this hand, look in this hand. But you need to kind of look over in the other hand. Look at it from the point that they know the grand solar minimum is coming. Almost everything you've grown up is going to knowing is going to change, including the economy. You would do the exact same thing. You would spend as much as you could on, on worthless paper that's going to be worth nothing in the future and get yourself ready. That's what I would do. Human nature is human nature. If I think I can save the most amount of people doing scenario A, that's what I would do to try to save the most amount of people that I could. The squeeze point is here. Now, you're going to have to deal with it. Now, whatever, whatever way you deal with it, great. But understand, as this thing intensifies and as these crops come at the end of this year and the yields are going to be so underneath what they have predicted, so far underneath that it is going to shake the, the futures market, where it's going to make front page news on how fast this stuff is rising like day after day, it's going to be price rise after price rise, and they're going to not. But they're going to try to explain it away as trade wars, as political things down in South Africa, as some weather disruption based on CO2. They're going to try to control the narrative the best they can. This is where stations like myself and information like myself and Ben are putting out, and so many others. I say, Farmer Christian over there, and Ben up as suspicious observers, and that whole crew with Trevor and Billy. How about Diamond Oppenheimer Rands Project? Christopher, the climate guy, Ice Age 2050. There's an enormous amount of crew out there. And start up at, you know, what's up with that? And Mark Morano and all these guys. There's so many. Dr. Roy Spencer. And it just goes on and on and on. People know what's about to happen. The, the voices are small, but they're trying to get out there to say, hey, these things are here. It's cyclical. Others at the higher level of government know what's happening. And they're not going to help you. They're getting themselves ready, but not you. Hence, the strangeness of the world we see. And this is where the media gets involved because they're going to try to distract you from all these changes that are occurring. You think they're really going to come out and say, hey, by the way, we're in a 400-year cycle. Ain't going to be enough food. You're on your own. And uh, if you go and riot anything, we just shoot you on the street. You think people are going to accept that? I highly doubt it. So what I feel is the media is going to be more, uh, let's say, forceful than they are now. And since I have been talking about our need moving forward in this new society that we're entering as our global grain production starts to be reduced in yield, your food prices are going to skyrocket. And I mean skyrocket, not just doubling or tripling, something like five or ten times higher, but 2020 at the very least. TrueLeafMarket.com, I really want to talk about growing your own food, which will be a necessity moving forward They've been around since 1974, heirloom and organic seeds. You know, since I've started talking about them in my videos, I have a lot of people write and say that they've previously ordered, that they know the owner, having great results, good customer service. They quite enjoyed the seed quality as well. And there's so many ways that we can go about growing different types of vegetables that we're going to need. You know, microgreens are incredibly nutritious. They're super fast to grow. In less than a week, you can have something that you can eat. And we know the benefits of microgreens. All you have to do is use a search engine and look up vitamin, mineral, nutrient content of microgreens. You'll be shocked. Also, sprouts. 
We can get those a little bit taller, a little more dense, a little bit larger volume on the vegetation mass coming off of there. So how do you know what kind of sprouts to grow? How about wheatgrass or herbs? What about different types of herbs that we can add to our foods? Now, what I just described to you, there's a full range of starter guides there at trueleafmarket.com for you to take a look at. Even if it's just for your own knowledge and you don't purchase something from them, at least get the information so you know how to grow microgreens, you know how to grow sprouts, you understand what some of the herbs are for. And not only that, they have wheatgrass and grain seeds. So what I'm talking about grain growing regions going offline, we just need to look back in history and see where across the planet there was difficulty growing grains when this grand solar minimum intensified and the jet stream started wandering just like they're doing today due to a decreased magnetosphere that does not hold our jet streams locked in their traditional flows. Grains are one thing, herb seeds are another, cover crops, something different, but whatever you do, organic seeds are going to be a necessity because... You can save those seeds and then grow them the next season, which you unequivocally cannot do with GMO. TrueLeafMarket.com. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. And I'll leave it right there because I wanted to go on to the crop losses too because this is another thing. You're not hearing about the crop losses in the regular corporate mainstream media. You're hearing about the crop losses in agroinsurance.com, agweb. Farmersinsurance.net, you know, these kind of farm journals. And what happens when farmers can't get crop insurance anymore? This is already starting to happen where private insurers are not insuring some crops in Nebraska and Oklahoma any longer. Kansas, too. There's some places, there's some counties out there. Now, they have to go to the federal insurance program because they can't get private insurance anymore because too many of the insurers are paying out on the losses this year and the year prior. So, you know, again, you know, putting the burden back on the government. Now, what if there's a, some kind of, you know, sticking point or a squeeze point with the government? They're not going to be able to pay the insurance. Then what? You know, we get in a whole can of worms coming forward here. Now, Canada, here's another one of Canada. 2018, one of the hardest growing seasons ever. Early season frost, late season frost, and then, you know, a huge amount. They had more than 3 million acres wiped out. From the early unseasonable snows and frosts that came down, talking about once in a lifetime, never seen this before type of freeze. It is story after story of these same types of evidence of drought and insurance claims and decreased yields and spring frosts and climate change contradicting you know, what the IPCC is saying. So you can't rely on the mainstream media to bring this out to you. The corporate-controlled media will not give you this information. You're going to be on your own to go out to professional sites to look for this type of info. I like the ideas, though, of the evolution of aquaculture. That's one of the articles that's on here. And, you know, take that to heart. What can you grow in a water environment around you? Are there ponds? Are there lakes that you could stock out with fish, turtles, something like this? Could you create an environment for birds there? Could ducks live there? Can you raise ducks? Well, I mean, what can you put in play with a water environment? And could you actually turn it into an aquaculture facility where you're actually farming the fish with a secondary or tertiary byproduct coming off there, whether it be water plants growing along the periphery that could be eaten, cattails, for an example? Or could it be others? You know, you could throw some frogs or, uh, you know, turtles in there as well for another protein source. I mean, how could you take it up several levels with the aquaculture? You know, we're going to have to put these things in the greenhouse. I mean, how many of you have the skill to build a greenhouse, repair a greenhouse, even grow anything in the greenhouse from square one? Also, I did a, an article on the wheat production globally and the demand from Asia. As a global total. So Asia consumes 304 million tons of wheat yearly. Now, what has already happened? And this is actually now time, not in the past. Now, today, going through what the 28th, 29th, and 30th of September. Asian buyers are not being able to secure enough supply coming out of Russia or the traditional suppliers from Europe. The traditional suppliers from the rest of Asia are not exporting, i.e. China has just cut off exports. So other Asian buyers are looking to other suppliers around the planet. 
and one that they did find with a tiny bit of extra supply, 1.5 million extra tons this year in increased production was Argentina. That's it. Everywhere else declined that grows wheat. Let this sink in for a second. Every major wheat producer on the planet declined this year in yield except for one country, Argentina. The entire global wheat supply is going to be down more than 30 million tons. And Asian buyers are looking to Argentina for 1.5 million tons. This is where we're at with the wheat right now. This is the information you will not be hearing in your mainstream media. Australia, you know, they were looking. Another fact that might shake your head and say, what? That's impossible. If you go back and look at the yields coming out of Australia in 2000. 11 to 2014 was approximately 12 million tons per year coming out of uh, Western and Southeastern Australia for the wheat. This year, they're down around to total max, possibly 3 million tons. And that was before the massive frost came in and wiped out the crops over in Western Australia over the last week. So farmers were saying record harvest in Western Australia. Oh, contraire, mon frere. Perth shivers through the chilliest night ever, and there were so many places that had record cold temperatures that blew through their all-time record cold, shattering those records. Actually, ice on the plants, on the heads. People talking about white winter landscapes as far as you could see, but those were the tops of crops that were leaves that were turned white from the frosts. So do the math. 2011, 13, 14, Australia had 12 million tons of wheat. Now we're going to be less than 3 million tons. That is 75% reduction in the wheat yield coming out of Australia from 2011 to 2018. What's going to happen when they move forward and it gets cooler and drier through the next couple years? You know, the Alberta farmers are struggling with drought as well. Drought-induced crop losses all through Canada. And it just keeps adding up. So, you know, just add another here. You should just, you know, if you really want to do this by yourself... I have an idea to do some more number crunching, but as a simple number crunching, find where the major wheat suppliers are and start with just the big ones like Australia, South Africa, United States, Western Europe. That would be the Euro Mountains, et cetera. The breadbasket right there in the Ukraine and, and Poland, et cetera, there's up in there. And then go over to Russia and then go to China pretty much and just use those. You don't have to go to Kyrgyzstan and some crazy smaller place that's a major producer as well, but you could. Right next, it's west of China. Go to Kashgar. Keep going west. You'll come into Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, both. See how much these countries produce in terms of yield before and go back a couple years. Don't, just don't go to last year because that's when they started to see more losses was last year and uh, two years ago. So go do that. Go back to 2011 and see what the output was for country A, B, or C. And then measure it up with what the yields are coming out of today, coming up. Not the forecast, but hang loose for another couple months until they really see what they're getting out of the fields in terms of physical yield. Because these projections are just pipe dream projections. I'm going to come out and say they're absolute fabrications. My own opinion, you can agree or disagree with me, but I am personally saying on my own opinion, those numbers are fabrications not to spook the markets. They're waiting as long as they can at the very last second not to spook the market, but when it comes in, holy moly, at the end of the year, prices are going to just, they're going to jump, and that's going to spook people's <laughs> why it's jumping so much, and they're just not going to be able to figure it out. It'll take a minute, but they'll get it figured out. And the media will be there to distract you the entire time to try to explain it away. So do yourself a favor. Just go around these biggest major producers like Ukraine. Go to there. They have a lot of good statistics out of the Ukraine. Uh, they have good crop insurance uh, data and the trackers, if you will, of how much is coming out of the ports there. So Ukraine's pretty easy to find info on. Argentina is easy to find info on. Uh, U.S., you know, other places, India, you can find information about all these producers. So go see what they produced, say, 2011 and 12, and then see what they're producing now. 
and then expect losses next year. Because if they've been losing for two years in a row or three years in a row, you can just expect the next trend will be down. So the trend may be Argentina up because they in, they were at even or a little bit up, and now this year they're up another one and a half million tons. So for the last couple of years, I think they were up 300,000 tons prior year, but then this year they're up one and a half million tons. Don't know if that's from just distribution and reuse of land and allocation for other crops to be grown in other places, swapping, you know, away from soybeans over to wheat, something like that. Maybe they saw the glut of soy coming and they decided to switch to wheat. Not sure. I haven't dug into the info. I just know they had an extra production this year. This video is brought to you by our friends at trueleafmarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet. 